The longer we take to try and solve a case, the longer this person is out there in the community and uh, are they going to kill again and can we save someone's life? When you dig dig deep into their world that they're occupying, you're going to find people like this. And bloodied handprints on a wall, so it's yeah. just like a horror movie. Welcome back to part two of my chat with Charlie Bazina. Uh, we're doing a deep dive into a homicide investigation. If you missed part one, we're talking about... Uh, Charlie's experience leading an investigation where the body of a uh, naked female was found. In the first part, we talked about how the crime scene's managed, how the victim was identified as Kelly Hodge, a lady in her early 20s, how Charlie's investigation and uh, his team, they found out uh, about Kelly's lifestyle. She was a sex worker. And she was last seen about six days, or the last known movement of Kelly was six days before her body was uh, found. Using uh, phone records, canvassing areas, and appealing to the public through the media. We're now at the stage of the investigation we turn our attention to uh, finding, uh, looking at the suspects, persons of interest. And uh, Charlie, first of all, welcome back. Thanks, uh, Gary. So this gets into mm -hmm. the, uh, the attention to detail is what we've covered in uh, in part one, the crime scene. Now we're getting into, and I've, exciting's probably not the right word, but it's something that uh, I know as a homicide detective, mm. that's when the things really got interesting when you started to identify suspects and uh, test, your, uh, uh, test your theories and your thoughts on whether this person may or may not be involved in the investigation. Mm. In my experience, most homicide investigations, unless you've got the smoking gun scenario, there's a number of suspects yep. and you've got to follow those leads to uh, either exclude them or uh, or firm up the evidence against them. So do you want to take us uh, to uh, this investigation, the uh, the murder of uh, Kelly Hodge, uh, and tell us uh, about how you work through the suspect list? Yeah, well, you know, the more people you speak to, and this went through the um, information from the uh, Sex Workers Cooperative, speaking to uh, associates of, of Kelly's and the like, start, you start building up a picture because, A, I've never met Kelly, had never met her prior to her demise, um, and I need to build that picture up. It's like any deceased we go to, you know, um, um, whilst you're not emotionally attached, uh, which is a good thing, not to the deceased, um, you, you, you've you got that job to do and you've got to build up that picture of someone you've never met and, yeah. and this person is not telling you so you've got to build that picture up by going to the, the, the I suppose the ring around the, the deceased person so as things progress this is t I'm talking weeks and into months this is all happening so okay. without specifically going as to when did you get this suspect or that suspect uh, these are ticking along so at this particular point of time, because we are running other investigations, it basically boils down to, to me making a decision saying, OK, identifying a particular detective on my team is going to be uh, the nominal, what we call informant, or the one yeah. that will be putting the whole file together. And in this case, it was a fellow called Andrew Kilpatrick. And uh, the beauty of us, certainly in Melbourne and Victoria, um, way back then, and things changed, unfortunately, that we were able to handpick our team members. It's so, so crucial about uh, allowing a team leader to pick, and it's like any corporation, it's like any area when you're doing interviews, because I like to pick my detectives for like with like. Yep. Um, and I didn't want gunslingers, I didn't want hot shots, I didn't want big headed ones to say, I'm on homicide squad, stand back, look how good I am. I wanted the old quiet achievers, and based upon my my own persona, I think of just achieving stuff and getting yep. it on with the job under the radar, and not beating our chest and that type of thing, and and identifying the different strengths as you would have with your team. You know, we all had different strengths and weaknesses, and you were able then to juggle it because we're dealing with a, such an array of different people. We do in any investigations, mm. we know the strengths of our people, and say, you know what. Uh, um, Gary, 
can you do the do interview on this particular guy yeah. because I know uh, your makeup and I think you're a good fit with this particular person yeah. and that gives you the autonomy as a team a team leader to do that uh, and and having selected your own people and and certainly in in my detective uh, Andrew Kilpatrick and I keep saying his name because he does need the kudos in this particular investigation and he worked hand in hand with myself and and him but he is the one driving it at yeah. that stage because I've then got to go back as a team leader and run the team and run the other investigations and oversee the other court hearings that are going on and liaise with different people and run it run the administration side of the team with leaves, that type of stuff, and coordinating court matters and dealing with defence barristers and, and DPPs, etc. So all these things that go on, it just doesn't stop. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I said during the break, it gives me a headache just thinking about what we had to uh, had to go through running these investigations. But you touched on, before we get into the suspects, you touched on something that uh, I agree wholeheartedly with you about the ability to be able to match the investigator with the type of investigation. Mm. When you work with them closely, you know their skills, you know their weaknesses. Yep. Every detective has, has a different skill base. There's not what, one right or wrong Correct. way. Absolutely. But you want to be able to uh, put the person running the investigation, say for the informant, we might call it the officer in charge of an investigation that's got the skill set, yep. the drive and the personality yep. to manage that job. Yeah, and as I said earlier, whilst we don't get emotionally involved with a, a the deceased person in relation to saying, oh, it could have been my daughter that time, you, you then lose you lose sight of your yep. direction. But we do have ownership. We're not looking behind our back and saying, well, the buck does stop with us. Yep. It is us that is going to give the family's answers. Um, and it does become personal to us. Yeah, We don't like losing. Well, if you're not doing your job, someone literally gets away with murder. Correct, correct. And, that's, yeah. and kill again. Yeah. And uh, that's the big issue, and that we, we're very cognizant of that effect of saying, well, you know, the longer we take to try and solve a case, the longer this person is out there in the community, and uh, are they going to kill again, and can we save someone's life? And that, that's something that must have factored in too, given the fact that uh, Kelly was a sex worker, that they are vulnerable because of the, the nature of their work, and yeah. uh, you know, people could prey on them. And uh, so if you had a sex worker whose body had been uh, dumped in the manner that Kelly's is, mm. that would have been a very real consideration. Very Will this much person so. do this again? Very much so. So as the time progresses, and uh, you know, it is a matter of weeks into months that um, that's uh, run by, by um, Andrew, and uh, the first suspect we come across, um, um, or obviously not, is a, an old boyfriend. Now, these are the things we find out about them, and, and you, you've got to be in a position, and the things we find out as I go through each particular suspect is about, A, being able to prove that person A is responsible for the death of person B. How do I prove that? How do I link person A to the crime scene of person B about fibres, et cetera, et cetera? So we had nothing forensically at that stage to compare against anybody from the crime scene or the deceased person. But uh, the link uh, I look towards is certainly the clothing and the phones, et cetera, which is so important to us. So we do then put, um, whilst we had no result on the clothing, we do put an alert out on the phone uh, through with the carrier. Um, now it's it's something we've got to cover off on. Some of us saying, "Oh, it's not. Oh, look, it's probably long gone now. Let's not bother about it." Mm. You don't. You've got to go down the process of putting, in case the phone gets reactivated yeah. in some way. It's something's got to be there. So we go through the first suspect, and as I said, an old boyfriend. He had a violent background, and he was in jail after killing a drug dealer. Uh, and Kelly actually gave evidence against him. So, you know. Okay, well, just, <laughs> yeah, well, then that, I don't think you have to be a homicide detective to look at that and go, that's worth having a look at. Very much so. Yeah. And, the, you know, it gets, your, gets your interest up. Your hairs go up in the back of your yeah. head and you say, well, mate, A, he's Kelly's boyfriend. He's got a connection to Kelly. He's, he's, he's a murderer. He's killed a drug dealer. And uh, Kelly actually gave evidence against him at the murder trial. So, so you, you, you've got certainly you've got motive, you've got capability it, and it, uh, opportunity, perhaps. Being yeah, very much so. Yeah. When you say capability, whilst he might be in jail, he could have got a cohort out yeah. there and say, "Go and kill that bitch," because she gave evidence against me, and he's got nothing to lose. He's in jail. I've got a perfect alibi. I'm in jail. So you yeah. don't turn off from the fact that oh, we eliminate him. He's in jail. Yeah. And the fact is, they do have phone calls, even though phone calls are monitored. Yeah. Uh, that might well be, and they do get visits. Um, in jail so that message can be put out there 
So again, you might say to yourself, and you say, this guy's looking pretty good. Well, how, how was that line of inquiry then followed up, and what was the conclusion? Well, again, um, we uh, follow up. We certainly check all the prison records. We check his visitors yep. and that type of stuff. Uh, and again, it all takes time. Uh, and unfortunately, we weren't able to progress that any further in relation to has he progressed or have we a link with someone on the outside that may be linked back to Kelly, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So nothing really come of that. So you, we put that aside. You don't eliminate it, yeah. but you just put it aside and you say, you know what, let's see what else comes up. And I, I, I look at situations like that where you can't eliminate them, mm. but okay, you've done, you've taken it as far as you can at this yeah. point in time. So then it's a case of moving on to another person of interest or so. suspect. Because you can always come back. Yeah. You know, you've got that documents, your suspect folders of documents. And, and you know, we are, and certainly with me and, and Andrew, the, the lead investigator at that particular stage, is we're having our briefings. Okay, yeah. where are we going with that? What's your next step? Because every one of us, our full team of 10 detectives when they are there, we glean on each other's experiences. Yeah. And I really get them involved. In, and A, they've got life's experiences. And they've got police experiences in different areas. I had an arson squad the detective sergeant who was very valuable to me in an arson murder, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the values. So you really rely so heavily on that team involvement, yeah. so much so. And that, that often comes out in the briefings. You, you're having, yep. having these briefings and someone that uh, might make a suggestion and you've been looking at the investigation for weeks, thinking, thinking, and they make this su suggestion have you considered this? And it just opens your, your thought process. It so it's so important. You certainly do get narrow-minded at times because you might have a line of inquiry yep. and you haven't opened it up. And one of my biggest aspects was when I had a new detective on board um, and I said, look, you, you've been here a week. Uh, we've just got another unsolved homicides. And I said, well, I'll bloody well kick your ass if you don't get involved in our debrief and have, oh, but I've only been here five minutes, Charlie. Yep. I, I, don't, no. I said, mate, you've got a lot more to input you don't yep. realise, but I want you, if you don't get involved, I'll be most upset about it. Oh, good said, advice. I want you to get involved, and uh, that paid off dividends in other cases yeah. that I did. So as the time progresses, um, you know, Andrew is coming up with these different suspects. Then we get to a second suspect. Now, um, Kelly, we found out, was raped by a particular client sometime previous, um, and she made a statement. Now, this offender, this client, mm. uh, went on to committing more rapes. And he had long blonde hair, similar to that found in Kelly's hand at the time. Okay. So we interview him. We then go to the process of having a forensic procedure done because we've got Kelly's uh, hand. There's a line of his exhibit at the post-mortem. We've bagged that exhibit and recorded that. The hair that. found in the, the hair. The hair found yeah. in the hair. was blonde hair. He had blonde hair. But again, all takes time. We just can't lodge that today and get yeah. a result tomorrow. So that's in the process. We had nothing else to tie him into, but clearly she made a statement against him. So again, he had motive. Yeah. Um, and this is the circles that unfortunately the, the likes of sex workers and drug users run in. Yeah. They're not running with uh, good people. Unfortunately, they're running with rat bags. They're running with criminals. And when you dig, dig deep into their world that they're occupying, you're going to find people like this. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And Everyone becomes to say, well, I've got 10 suspects. But it, but again, you know, as an investigator, I, I've still got to tie it up. I've got to link them in some way. Um, and what we started doing, we were solving more more uh, offences for the rape squad than we were trying to solve our murder. Because as we're going, we're solving these these, these uh, uh, offences. We're identifying these rapists. And then all of a sudden, we refer them to the rape squad. That's uh, uh, that's a interesting point you make there. If we just stop on, on the suspects for a second, but I've often thought that too with homicide investigations, whether it's into organised crime or sexual nature, mm. because there is so much detail uncovered in homicide investigations, invariably there's a spill-off. Yeah. Time and time again, I've been involved in investigations where we're looking for the murder, but you uncover other stuff because I think it's just the attention to detail and how deep you've got to go with homicide investigations. And I think it's a great lever because, hey, I'm not involved in any murder, but okay, yeah. I raped that Sheila. Yeah. And that's the thing they'll be saying. They'll, they'll readily make an admission to a, another major crime because of the the fear of I'm not being a murderer implicating yeah, in the murder. Yeah. Well, I I would call it my terminology was playing the homicide card when you you're knocking on the door it's homicide here and you can see the look on on Correct. people's face because they know oh this is serious. Yeah, very much. And if they've done something else yeah. maybe well that's the lesser I'll uh, I'll throw my hands yeah, up for that. Yeah, and then even in doing that that knock on the door, you say well you know you know the person's the drug dealer or whatever. You say mate I don't care about yeah. drug dealing. I, 
I'm not getting involved now. You do what you want. I'm not even going down that path. You talk to me about doing yeah. your drugs and yeah, I was dealing drugs and this was happening. I'm not going to charge you for that. Yeah. So it does become a particular realm to say, well, hang on a minute. Well, you can make that decision. You could get the autonomy to make that decision and use that to an advantage mm. and say, well, okay, tell me about your drug dealing, which then fills in the picture about leading up to the homicide or whatever. Yeah. But hey, I had nothing to do with the homicide, but I'm happy to tell you I'm a drug dealer. So that works, and that's what happened with this one. And, and that particular second suspect, uh, he was later arrested by the rape squad and, and committed uh, suicide shortly afterwards. So uh, he with, with 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 that when he was when he did commit suicide because I've had situations like that too where you're looking at uh, people and they they commit suicide mm. and sometimes you're left there with the investigation. Oh, did he commit suicide because he was hiding that? Yeah. With this one, and we'll call him the second second suspect. Yep. Um, when he committed suicide, did you still have did you still have to leave that line of inquiry to, open? That hundred percent until we know who's done yep, it. He's 100%. still potentially he, he in the mix. Active active yeah. suspect, even though he's deceased. Yeah, but we can then say, well, hang on, let's go back to that first suspect. Let's go back to the second suspect. He yeah. never wrote him off because they're deceased. Yeah. Yeah. Because has he killed himself in guilt? of that one are we getting too close yeah what's the reason for it just because of the rapes etc so no that he remains always uh and and had to that particular point so um uh, as we went on we finally get the result back of the hair in kelly's hand yep. and it was later identified as her own so that eliminated to a degree um the blonde hair of the second oh, suspect. okay so the su suspicion was attached if that uh, hair could be matched to his hair yeah. through dna uh, obviously it's still, still didn't eliminate him 100 yeah, percent though yeah. which is okay we know okay there's no link yeah so we can remove that link of saying well hair's in kelly's hand he's got blonde hair okay because i know what a defense barrister would do with that yeah and you know, i just can't say oh, blonde hair blonde hair it's yeah. got to be done uh, dna wise through the roots etc cetera, etc cetera. so again time goes on and marches on um, and then we, um, the third suspect, as we went back to the initial phone interrogation, uh, was Kelly's last client. Okay, which now, is an obvious, ob obvious, uh, yeah. obvious suspect. So, how, 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 how did you approach that? Well, it was difficult because this guy was a married man. Okay, uh, and it's not beyond the realms that we do get uh, married men in clandestine fashion of going seeing prostitutes yep. for whatever reason the case may well be. Um, so uh, we were very, uh, very mindful of that now, this person was a, a good person. Yep. He wasn't a criminal. Yep. Um, and uh, I don't know whether he was a, a normal client. I think I've got a memory that he may have been a, a normal client of Kelly. So why would he? Um, so you start building it and applying common sense and saying, OK. But we contacted him on the phone. We never go to his house Yeah. because we're saying, OK, We've got to deserve that respect to him. And uh, not just the respect too, and I think you get a distorted view if he was uh, answering the door to you guys, knocking, inquiring about uh, him seeing a sex worker yeah. and why his wife and children... The drama that there. would cause yeah, and yeah. unnecessarily. Yes. That's why we had all that contact on the phone. We had his phone number through Kelly's... Yeah. So we rang him up, come and see us. And, uh, and he certainly had a motive to come and see us because he didn't want us knocking on the door or yeah. being there. So that's something for him to deal with. But why should I then create a problem that doesn't exist in his family unit yeah. by going there? And so we are, we are mindful of that. We, we have empathy towards that of saying, yeah. OK, and he's committing no offence as such. So let's I, I, I think that's reasonable because you could create chaos all through. Oh, very much you, so. you go Unnecessarily. To a, you go to a country town murders and everyone's got a secret and you could you could divide the town up if you uh, if you started uh, stirring people up. Yeah, yeah. So time marches on and, uh, and then we, uh, so we, we're fairly happy with our suspects. So just last, just last with, with that person, the third, third suspect. Last client, yep. He he readily admitted that he went to see Kelly yep. and that he and he had an alibi, uh, uh, right? So yeah, it was and you checked confirmed. the alibi out; 100%. it wasn't just yep. oh no, no, just don't tell. We follow every alibi down. Yep. You've got to, yeah. Uh, and then, but even if you do get an alibi and say he was with me at the time, you still need to convince yourself and be confident enough. And I can't recall yep. what his particular alibi was, but he at work, whatever the case may be. Yep that we were very confident in his alibi that it was legitimate. People so it might say, just not be a mate going, yeah, I was having me. a beer. You yeah. check the CCTV footage of the yeah. place. And, Something independent yeah. you know, yeah. to be confident. I need to be confident because I'm not going to eliminate someone and see we've still got the, uh, the first two suspects, or the first suspect, um, the first two suspect is potential. We never write them yeah. off. And uh, I, at least when we got to the you, third you suspect, could, the last client, write him off. we could say, you know what, we are confident that uh, this guy is legit. Uh, and again, demeanour, 
body language, how we ask our, yeah. answer our questions. All these things come into account. Yeah. Because you know if they're going to be nervous and say, oh, well, force right and open and uh, well, come and saw us. How often do you walk away from you've done a door knock or, or spoken to someone, with your, your partner, and you w- walk out there and go, that person was hiding something. Correct. You, you, something you, about you, it. Yeah. You, you feel That's it. That's your sixth sense. Yeah. You, you feel it. Something's not yeah. quite right. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's gain, and I, I want people to understand the um, nuances of uh, a homicide investigation and working through it. This is pressure in itself because if you're leading an investigation and you're going to say, okay, we're going to move on from that suspect, that person literally might get away with it. So, mm. and it, quite often, well, it's it's not definitive. You can't say you can't say that person hasn't done it, but you've just got to weigh up. Okay, well, we've got to explore all the other options. Yeah, and that's the way you just you start going through work it. Yep. your way methodically through a list of uh, persons of yep. interest and suspects. And yep. If you eliminate those, or you you, compliment, you go back to the starting yeah. point again, you say, yeah. well, what have we missed? Well, I, I've I've had investigations like that. You go through, everyone's eliminated. You're going to go back, Correct. and then you find something. Correct. Something, and more. then something might be out of left field. And say, you know what? What have we missed? Where, where else can we go? You then get your whole team together yep. and start building off their experiences and say, well, what if we try this? Mm. And you are looking at other aspects. You are, and it's no no secret. You are looking at listening devices. You are looking at telephone intercepts. You are looking at covert operatives. All these other avenues, because as investigators, you need to build a case around a person. Because I see certainly I think as you do you work on the premise that a person you arrest is going to say no comment yeah. and based on that because people are now better educated in, in what their rights are and they say no comment but I want to position and say thank you I have now can go home early here's a charge of murder yeah, because you're confident you've built yeah, a case you've around got, them. Got the, so, got the right uh, person, yeah, and that's where you, this thinking is the defence barrister going through these suspects. So what I do, I need when I tap someone on the shoulder and say, "You are under arrest for the murder of Kelly Hodge." Yeah. I want to be confident enough to say, "You know what? It's going to be a no common interview, but I can link him to this place. I can link him to the deceased. I can link him to the crime scene. I can link him some way to prove it to twelve people in that jury box beyond reasonable doubt." Um, it's that yeah. where I need to be and making that arrest because that's the pressure we're under because to take someone's liberty away from them is so significant. And it's high, high stakes when it's murder 100%. too. It's, it's not done. And, and ultimately, the media jump on it yeah. and they identify the accused person yeah. and uh, rightly or wrongly, whether they're acquitted or whatever, yeah, they're, they they're, remain. Yeah, and so they're, their life is changed now. I don't know, I'll be br- brash enough to say I don't lock up innocent people yeah. um, because of all these overriding tick boxes that I've got to have and convince Check, myself. Checks and balances. Because I know once I make an arrest, that's going to be in the media. That's going to ruin this person's life, whatever offence it is. And, and you don't. And I think people sometimes think uh, cops don't have empathy and we're just, ah, oh, what's it matter? We'll throw them before the court. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's not no, not the no. good cops I know and anyway. And it's reputational. It's, yeah. Look where you are today. Look where yeah. I am today. Um, You're doing the think, right thing. Uh, because of our reputation yeah. and of what we've achieved and how we've achieved it, um, you know, people hold us in, in high esteem in relation to what we've done in but, the past. Yeah, because we've been taking the work seriously and Correct. giving it the proper. And I just want to um, go back to, because it, it brings me back to, and I, I found it fascinating in homicide investigations. You're in the strike force room. You're looking at the whiteboard, and you say, "Are we missing something?" <laughs> yeah. Like time and time yeah. again, I've been on the tough investigations, and you've yeah. got everyone there. You're brainstorming, and you're sitting there. You're staring at this whiteboard because visuals help. Correct. There's a picture. We've got the timeline I need there. It. What the hell are we missing? Yeah. And uh, it's amazing what comes out of that, isn't it? It's a real. It, it, it is. Yeah. It is. But that's why I need visual. I need it up there because it's it's so much information in those five or ten folders. Yeah. But I need it up on the board to see it. So from a TV perspective, that they do that well. And that's the reason you do that, because seeing it up there, you can just see, you might have a link diagram, you might have a flow yeah. chart um, of things that are happening. Hang on, well, that puts him in that location. And, and you see it in front of you, uh, virtually in an animated situation, yeah. it, it, it really drives home to us. But you'll be looking at it, and someone brings up this other aspect. Well, how about doing this? What about doing that um, and, and doing this other aspect? Oh, that's a good idea. Let's try it. Because yeah. if you've got nothing else, you start clutching at straws. And the and media will only come into play yeah. if you've got something new. You can't say, can you run that story again? Well, no. no. <laughs> you <laughs> you need something uh, it's, new. It's, it's, it's old news. The other thing that uh, I encourage too on, on the particularly tough ones, and uh, just I don't care, Charlie, how stupid you think your idea might Correct. be. 
throw it up, tell me, and you encourage everyone in the yep. room. Go on, I, I don't care. Uh, and someone will, this might sound ridiculous, but what if blah, blah, blah. And you think, hold up, hadn't thought that way. That's, yeah. that's a good way of uh, brainstorming. Oh, it is. And then even uh, going back to life's experience, I'm getting off the subject a little bit here. And I had one detective who had a, uh, a murder of an RSPCA officer and um, time of death was important to us um, and location. And he said, what about, uh, we had a photograph of mm. an animal behind a gate, uh, a farm gate. He said, we can get a time off that photograph. Well, if we get an astronomer um, and a, um, a, a surveyor, we can tell the time, like a sundial, and we were able to tell the time of that photograph being taken in the location by these two people from Melbourne University saying that photograph was taken at 12.30 plus or minus 15 minutes. I, lo I love that. And that came from a detective, yeah. and I had no idea. Why didn't you come up with that, yeah. Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> it was obvious. <laughs> I know, I know, but it played a major role. And yeah. that really hit home to me that I was on the right track of saying, guys, you've been here five minutes. You might think I've been here 17 years. I haven't got all the answers. Yes. I need you guys to input, and then, you know, we'll go that way, and then we can... and then. Other team leaders, uh, team members see that and say, you know what, that's great. And they'll have the input. And we can all go away and say, have a beer later on. And, and, say, and well, doesn't that make for a harmonious team when everyone's invested, everyone They've feels like ownership. they're contributing? They've, yeah, We've yeah. all got ownership. Whilst, um, okay, we've got a nominal in informant yeah. uh, on the brief head, uh, it's, uh, I sign off on every brief of evidence. And I say to them, it's, it's significantly enough that these briefs can end up in the High Court in, in Canberra. Yeah. That's how significant these briefs are. And it's significant, and it's your reputation. And, they, uh, and there's nothing better when we get an arrest that we go and have a few beers and we pat ourselves on the back yeah. uh, and we have that elation for a short time after we've given the message to the families prior to making the arrest yeah. and saying, look, there might be something in the paper tomorrow. And then we deliver that, but the 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 the, the fight, I suppose, still, still continues, and it's not done and dusted until that that verdict comes in. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a long process. Mm. Anyway, we're reminiscing here, Charlie, yeah. but <laughs> as coppers that, do, that's uh, yeah, that that's homicide. The, the passion um, oh, and love the it. emotion I attached to it. it. So, so we're, third suspect, we yeah. eliminated him. That yeah, was the that last was the client, client because and then of we, his uh, alibi. Again, talking to different people and now we had an, a police informer uh, yep. so a police informer t reaches out to us and um, he said he had spoken to a suspect who told him that he had hurt a woman and he had prize for assaults okay a little bit far-fetched but uh, mm -hmm. something has come to us we put weight on it and um, the fact and looked at looked at, at this person's yep. history now whether he was actually tied to that area i can't recall but something has come to us uh, uh, an informer to do that um uh, and he had hurt women. So what we end up doing in that particular one, we identified him uh, as living in a caravan at the back of his grandmother's house. Now, we, we took out a warrant on this particular guy. Um, I think he had minor priors. So we take out a warrant mm -hmm. um, and lived in a caravan at the back of his grandmother's house. And, he, and in executing that warrant, he had cut out pictures of, of thousands of, cut out pictures of kids and females on the wall. Mm. As we go through the search, he had a handbag that belonged to a receptionist from a brothel who he had also assaulted and attended to rape some time previous. So again, like our first suspect, the hairs on the back of your head start coming up. Um, and the other companion issue with him was he lived not far from the vicinity where Kelly's body was found. So we've got location. Yeah. We've got uh, interaction with other sex workers uh, in the brothel. We've got a handbag. And he looked, he was looking it's really, really good for me. It, Absolutely. It, it's, it's ticking some boxes, isn't it? Very much so. Yeah. But it was that little niggling thing with me with this one to say, you know what, he ticks all those boxes, but what have we really got? Yeah. What have we really got? How would that be viewed at a trial? The DPP wouldn't even look at it and say, well, no, we just haven't got enough. But this bloke, he's out there. Yeah. He's in the right location. He's got that history. He's got that. Um, uh, and there's other in, uh, in investigations. So we uh, liaise, as we, d we don't do it in a, in a silo perspective. We Throughout this time, with other suspects we had, we've been liaising with the rape squad because yep. uh, that's invariably what happens with uh, a lot of the sex workers. Um, and then uh, we uh, bring the rape squad back into it for another one, and they investigate him for some other rapes. That They were able to proceed with uh, some rape charges against him, but 
still didn't eliminate him as from my inquiry. He was yeah. looking as a good suspect, but you know what? I'm just falling short to be able to charge this bloke. It looks good yeah. circumstantially, but is it enough? No, it's not. Charlie, I, I, I understand where you're there with that, and like there are like some things that uh, make you very excited and think, okay, this might, might be the person. What I've done in the past, and I've encouraged people to do it, it, it worked for me. In situations like that, you get excited, you think, yes, yes, yes. Put it down. What sort of set of facts would you present to the court? Correct. And when you actually type it, type yeah. it up, you realise I haven't got anything other than suspicion. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And we need more than that. Yeah. Uh, and that's the beauty of it. And that's where you know we might get a, a, you know some inexperienced people on my team and not been there long, and they get uh, quite excited about it. Yeah. But to look at it that way and identify it that way, they go, they can start think for themselves. They don't need me telling them. Yeah as an experienced homicide investigator, they need to come to that conclusion themselves. It carries a lot more weight. You say, you know what? Charlie's right. Yeah, well, I, because I, I was taught this way, and, mm. and I, I know you've learnt your trade from people that have taught you, but, uh, yeah, when I, I was, yeah, yeah, this is it. Put it down on a set of fact sheet. And, or, uh, and just as in how would you, what would you present to the court? Yeah. I've done that to other people uh, yeah. under my command and said, okay, well, you, you keep telling me it's this person, this person. Type up the fact sheet that we're yeah. going to charge them with, and when they come back, yeah, well, yeah, you might be right. We're, yeah. we're not, uh, not. I right. had a little uh, humour stuff, and you know, we all got black humour. But um, I had a, a, a cardboard box uh, in the office, yep, and I, I uh, pasted on the front of it evidence box, <laughs> yeah. and uh, that was one of the other aspects from looking at the as way you've described. Yeah, hey Dave, go and have a look at the evidence box. Is there anything in it? No, it is not. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, good way of putting you know, it. So you're trying to make a bit of humour in it because okay. it's not all doom and gloom. Then what, what What was this fella like when you spoke to him? Look, nervous. Yeah. Uh, clearly they become nervous because they know they've been committing offences. Yeah. Um, and then you've got the homicide squad knocking on his caravan door. We've got grandma there he's living with. Um, a, a typical deviant of, yeah. of, of sorts, and you're going to say, you know what? Whether he tells me it's daylight outside, I'm going out to have a look. Yeah. You know, this you just never. And the, the the trouble is with with those if you're investigating a crime like murder or any particular crime, they're going to look suspicious any time you speak Correct. to them, whether they're involved. In absolutely, because they're just that creepy. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, um, and just to go back a step, now I said earlier that we took out a warrant. Now, what people are going to realise also that. In taking out a warrant, it's not a matter of saying, okay, just uh, get a signature. Yeah. We've got to type up an affidavit to support and give us the authority to be able to enter a premises by force if need be. Yep. Now, that's not taken lightly not by a all. magistrate yeah. and nor by us. So a magistrate in this particular case could have said, no, nah, you haven't got enough. I don't care. What else have you got to yeah. link him to your murder, Charlie? Well, nothing to link him to it, but you know, he's got uh, this particular history. You know what? No, I'm not going to give I you a warrant. I don't think there's uh, Exactly. To so all we could then do is knock on the door. Uh, he uh, tells us to bugger off or whatever. Mm. And then what have we got? So so there are the checks and balances that we've got to fall in within the process. It's yeah. not as easy as saying, well, just go and search his house. No, we need yeah. a warrant. Uh, because you work on the worst premises, say, go away. And I want to say, hey, here's a warrant. Give him a copy. We're coming in. Because he can't afford to lose that because you don't know what evidence is. So we are convincing other people and, and they're the checks and balances that keeps us in line of saying well you bless you just, you're not in a police state you just can't do as you please and yeah. away you go so and I, I think there's you but it's important that police don't abuse that power and, and just yeah apply for warrants all, all the time yeah. because then the magistrates oh if i if i got to the point where i wanted to apply for a warrant i wanted the magistrate to think well if they think it's uh it warrants at this point in time an application for a warrant yeah. There must be something that merit to it. And the most important aspect there is, as we spoke about earlier, is reputationally. Yeah. They know Gary Jubilant. He's had other warrants with me. Um, and it's always been, because you report back to them, it's always had a result. Yeah. This bloke's not pie in the sky. And don't think for one minute for the police officers out there listening, is magistrates talk. <laughs> yeah. You know, judges talk. Yeah. They know because... You, Police are appearing before them all the time in different uh, uh, jurisdictions. Yeah. So if you're a cowboy and you're flying by the night and you're just getting complaints against you about doing stuff, this is where your reputation and credibility is so, so it's important. That it, you could have a line ball, and I've had them. You can have a line ball affidavit that you really need a warrant for, and the magistrate will look at you, 
and say, you know, it is line ball, but I know this person. Yes. I know his reputation. I know his credibility. You know what? I'm happy to put my line, this is the magistrate, yeah. by signing, because he can be held to account. He or she can be held to account they, also. They have a, a big responsibility. Because defence browsers yeah. can call them and say, why did you give a warrant on this flimsy information mm. to Mr. Bazina? And so they're, they're as accountable as anybody else. But if what gets you over that line with a, at times when you really go there with a light affidavit yep. is the person you are as an investigator, and they all know it. Definitely. And that pushes across the line. So it's so, so important. And I keep saying to the younger members that I have opportunities to speak to is you do it right. We work, we work by the rules, crooks don't. Yep. And if you don't do it right and you start cutting corners, will you explain to the uh, family as to why this guy got acquitted? And don't cheapen, cheapen your reputation. Because mate, yeah. at the end of the day, you don't represent just yourself, you represent me, you represent the Homicide Squad, you represent Victoria Police, and you represent the state government. So yeah. don't think you're cutting corners in relation to what you're doing. That's the difference in being a homicide investigator to a normal general duties detective. They're out there, there's yep. significant detectives out there, not belittling those at all, but that's the nth degree you then go to mm. as a specialist investigator, be it in rape, homicide or sex offences or pedophilia, whatever the case yeah. may be. So, so significant. Well, uh, and you're quite right because there's, yeah, the drug squad experts, there's all, all the different types yeah. of experts that uh, carry their reputation gets them a long way. Yeah, so then as time goes on. So we're, Okay, so we've gone through four suspects yeah, at this, this stage. This guy's been investigated and by the, raised by the rape squad. This, this is the fourth guy who lived in the caravan. Now we go on to the fifth uh, suspect now. So all, all this too, Charlie, and uh, again, like people people are wondering, well, what are homicide detectives doing? This is this is months of work Absolutely eliminating months. Uh, yep. the, these people. And this is and it's not like it's uh recognition. You've oh you've solved it. No, I yep. haven't solved the crime. But this is the type of work that needs to be done to get to solving the crime. And that's right. And then I have to emphasize to a lot of people that and this is where your patience, you've got to be patient as an investigator. Yeah. A there's no time limit on homicide investigations. They remain active until the very day that you get a conviction. Yep. So therefore, the only time issue you've got is the fact that you've still got this killer out in the community. But I can't act because I don't have the evidence against him yeah. or her. So that's the process. So that's where the drive you've got all the time, you know, and we look forward to the day of knocking on families' doors to say we've arrested someone. So then we get into our, uh, our fifth suspect. Now, Prior to Kelly's murder, this particular suspect had seized Kelly's car to pay a drug debt that was owed to him by Kelly. And again, he was a suspect of rape and torture and assault of sex workers in St Kilda. Where are these people coming yeah, from? Yeah, well, you've, you know. you've, 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 uh, you're really <laughs> scraping the, uh, the underbelly, oh, aren't you? Oh, look, they've they just got that link. And then you're saying, yeah. God, here's another one. But again, a, a direct link to Kelly... The fact that she's bought drugs off him, she owed him a drug debt, and he, he then forcibly seizes her car, and also a suspect for rape uh, and torture. And the rape and torture prior con uh, convictions fits in with the, the assaults on yeah, Kelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was and a violent thing. Exactly, so, and works in St Kilda. And now, as we looked at him a lot closer, we find out that one sex worker had escaped from his house after being assaulted and left naked. Here's another tick. Yep. And he also tortured uh, another uh, female, a 16-year-old girl. So this bad, this guy's a bad, bad dude. Yeah. And no no, no uh, um, uh, respect for women at all, given the fact that he actually tortures them. Um, we then learn that this guy's in possession of a gun at that time of committing these offences. Uh, and apparently this was over stolen drugs, that he would just grab these people. Yeah. And this is how these low-life drug dealers work that uh, they don't care and they'll just maim and kill and, and carry on whatever the case may be. Yeah, it hasn't got many redeeming features. Not at it? all. Not at all. But these people are out there. So ultimately, he started looking pretty good. So we said, okay, we uh, we then, then get enough uh, to get a warrant, going back to a magistrate. So we get a warrant. We find out where he's living. But because this guy is unpredictable um, and uh, we learned he's got a gun at the time, we then bring in our specialist people. Yep. You know, am I going to go and knock on this person's door and uh, 
you know, him start shooting through the door, wherever the case may be. You start formulating a plan. Yeah. Everything you do has to be uh, risk managed, risk assessed, mm. et cetera, et cetera, because I'm not going to put my people in harm's way, nor the community. So how? what's the best way? The fact that the gun comes up, okay, that's enough for me at that stage, and in those days a lot, lot easier to get the SOG. And we, then we sit down with the SOG. We've been dealing with the rape squad. And then we're dealing with another specialist unit. The so SOG, these are the tactical policing. Very much so. Yep. Yeah, to to assist me in doing an arrest of this particular person. A, I've got enough to arrest him based on uh, his antecedents, his, his history, his background. That's been enough to to convince a magistrate to give me a warrant. Yep. And it's been enough for me to convince my command to allow me to use a special tactical squad or what we call the SOG, Special yep. Operations Group in, in Victoria. So we sit down with them, we formulate a plan uh, driven by them to say, well, okay, the best way to do it, and they've got to do a risk management again. All this planning goes into place. How can we intercept this person? There's no risk to him, no risk to the police, and no risk to the public. Yep. So a major, a major formulation plan goes in, and in this particular instance, they, they decide to do a mobile intercept. Um, we sit in the background, we don't get involved in that. Uh, they run the whole shooting match from that point. There's a particular way that they do a mobile intercept when they look at it, and they do it quite successfully, and they are able to arrest him. Uh, we arrest him, they then say, Charlie, here he is, they've done their job, uh, and off they go, and then we take the suspect back to his house with possession of a warrant, because yep. you always be pre-prepared. No point in arresting him and saying, oh, let's go and get a warrant now. <laughs> This is the pre-planning that I, goes I, I, in. You, you bring, you're bringing it across in, in great, uh, a great way of the amount of detail that goes into it. And, you know, you're getting tactical police involved. You've got to find the location. You don't just, you just don't find him on the street. You've Correct. got to know where he's going to yeah. be at a certain time. Surveillance. It's got to be surveillance. Yeah. You've got to have warrants. You've got to have everything in place. In place, because yeah. I know I need to be three steps ahead. If this happens, what do I do? If that happens, and what I, do I, I do? And I suppose if we dispel the you know, myths from um, uh, TV shows and movies, this is behind the scenes, the amount of time and paperwork Correct. that's involved in these investigations. They show you the exciting <laughs> yeah. stuff, but there's a hell of a lot of work that it goes is. in. It is. This is the mundane stuff. Yeah. I, I know, but uh, you know, it just doesn't happen. And, um, and we're probably three or four months into this investigation yeah. as it is. And, and that's, well... Andrew Kilpatrick is juggling other investigations. Yeah. Not, we just don't have one investigation. I, I'm, I'm just uh, getting tired at the thought of uh, planning that operation. Yeah, yeah. You, as you said, surveillance, warrants, tactical police. Yeah, operation plan. Yeah, and uh, getting it all signed off on, approved, yeah. and all signed. Yeah, yeah. because it's not our I's and cross our T's. And let's say, for example, and the, are you mindful? Let's say, for example, he puts up a fight, the SOG shoot him dead. Yeah. Then it opens up in a cranial. I'm leading the investigation. I'm held to account. So all these things I can say, there's our risk management. We had to risk, why well, was the easiest way to risk it? And it creates a whole new monster into the yeah. investigation. And it, it's, it saves you too if that it does. type of thing happens. I had an operation uh, I was running that someone shot and killed. What saved from criticism was all the records and yeah. all the planning. That yeah. It wasn't an ad hoc cowboy Can't do it. Yeah, knock on the door and yeah. uh, pull out a gun. Yeah, so. very much. So we do the mobile and execute the search warrant and then it adds fuel to the fire. Whilst we're executing the search warrant, we find a handbag, we find female boots, we find a jacket that's similar to Kelly's, Kelly's, and there's blood throughout the house. You know, this guy's starting to look really good. Yeah. And uh, but at that stage, it all looks good uh, in visually. Um, but we need to start saying, is it Kelly's uh, uh, bag? Is it Kelly's boots? Is it Kelly's yeah. jacket? It's similar to it. And there's blood throughout the house. How does that uh, work out? Then it goes on in the. He was actually wearing a large metal ring that could have inflicted injuries to Kelly's body. Consistent with the bruising and that's the marks. That's right. And that's yep. the importance of being present at the post-mortem. Yeah. I've seen her injuries. Yeah. Now I'm looking at a potential ring of, an, of a potential good suspect that may inflict it. And I'm saying, I've got that in my mind. The photographs are back at the office. I saw that. That's, yeah. that's not dissimilar. The, you know what? And that's the purpose of having that knowledge. Now, clearly, um, he denied any knowledge of Kelly's murder, but because we're talking homicide, but admitted to other assaults. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. I didn't involve any yeah, murder. Oh, yep. oh well, I can tell you about these other assaults, him not knowing what information we know. A lot of times, how often you, you've had it, you knocked on the door, oh, I was waiting for you blokes to turn up. Well, what do you mean? You, you go in there as a witness. Let them let let talk a bit. <laughs> let them no, talk right. and then I've told you about it. No, I'm Robbie that yeah. I've done. No, it so. actually wasn't what we were <laughs> going to speak to you about, but thank you. Yeah. So uh, that's the power, I suppose, 
of the, of the significance office that you hold as a homicide yeah, investigator. Yeah, it's a pressure that's applied. So we have all that. So we put the ring in for forensic examination. We put the clothes in. We take the clothes to the grandmother to identify things. Um, and uh, as things go on, he remained a strong suspect at that particular point of time. Again, was he in custody with the other stuff that you'd arrested him for, from at this stage? Uh, no. Right. Okay. No. So he was no. released. Uh, and, yeah. I yep. can't remember what type of assault, but they uh, yep. were certainly minor at that stage. And then, but uh, uh, and again, he was referred to the rape squad with these other assaults because of his of his history and, and his uh, involvement with the women and what he's done in the past. So we just don't write him off. We then again liaise with the rape squad and say, mate, this guy needs to be looked at. He's made admissions to certain assaults. Does that fit in with investigations yeah. you're running or local divisional detectives are running? So we open up the whole scope and saying, hey, it's out there and share the intelligence. He remains a strong suspect. So um, we then do uh, the blood checks. The DNA of the blood in the house was not Kelly's. But other victims' blood um, uh, and the rings, we, we identified the rings forensically, uh, The any blood on the rings. How did you, you feel when that came back? Because at, at that point in time, you'd be going, I think think we got him, or you know, you, you're confident you're pointing in the right direction. And when that came back and it wasn't uh, yeah. Kelly's... It's a bit like you with your surfing, I suppose. You're on the crest of the wave and all of a sudden you get dumped. <laughs> I get dumped all the time. <laughs> so yeah. it does. Look, it, it comes back... The, the blood in the house is not Kelly's. Yep. We've done the forensic examination of the rings, and it's uh, it's not Kelly's. Yeah. You get deflated, but you don't get dejected. Because, it, and, and this, I think people need to understand, I think the organisation needs to understand, whether it be Victoria or New South Wales, you are making progress by eliminating Correct. things. Like, yeah. that's the nature of a homicide investigation. It, it, part of the... the work is eliminating people it is and just yeah. going through it yeah. and you could be well off off the beam as we have been and again the clothes identifies not being Kelly's for the grandmother so that's another tick out of the box but we yeah. then refer him to the rape squad what have we lost we've gone that av- down that avenue of inquiry yeah and we can tick that box at this stage but he remains in our suspect category yeah, yeah. No, not a problem at all um, so after that it pretty much starts going cold because our avenues of inquiry pretty much been exhausted Nothing on more on the phones. The associates have all been spoken to. Yep. The um, the uh, uh, sex uh, workers co- uh, cooperative, um, as uh, their intelligence has all been followed up on. Didn't get much intelligence from door knocks. Um, not much information came from anywhere else. And even information from these suspects that might have said, oh, look, it wasn't me, but have a look at uh, Dave Smith or yep. have a look at these people. There's no follow-on, basically. So after this particular fifth suspect, they're, they're the difficult times in investigations, yeah. aren't they? That, that's when you, you, you see the quality of the people that you got on the team, yep. how motivated they are, yep. how, how driven and, and how tenacious. And you certainly need uh, tenacity on the investigations because it can break people. Very much oh, so. We've worked so hard, we're never going to solve this. Yeah, yeah, well, that's what I don't want to hear. I don't yeah, want to hear the, that the negativity. Moment, the, the moment that, that mindset comes in, you're better off not having that person involved Correct. in the investigation. Correct. And then... So at the end of all of that, we said, okay, and we whiteboard it again. These are yep. our suspects. <clears throat> Where have we gone? Where can we take it? What else can we do? Do we have enough to take out a listening device warrant? Do we have enough to take out a telephone and yeah. warrant? No, we don't. No, we don't. Okay. What other things? Let's start thinking outside the square. And is there anything else we can, any other direction? Can we go and look at another associate of these particular people? So we then brainstorm at the end of the day saying, what other avenues can we go to? Can we take it back to the media? Well, we need something new there. So we asked, looked at all these different aspects, especially when the trial starts going a little bit cold. So you then don't just sit there and say, wait for something to come in. But it's the old story, and we've always said it, you and I, it, we're a phone call away from an, a, a solving that's a, a crime. That's, that's you know? the nature of homicide. Exactly. And you never write it off, as you say, but you then know all our avenues of inquiry. A little bit early at this stage to start looking at a reward. Mm. Um, uh, because it, you really go to the, you know, some time later on, we're still, even though it's months down the track, we're still relatively fresh in the investigation <coughs> and hopefully to do it. And then we might think of it doing a cold case and re, re bring it out in, in time to come. But we're, at this stage, we've boxed it up, put it on the shelf. Um, again, feedback to the family and say, look, this is what we've done. Uh, we've pretty much come to a, a full stop. We're liaising also with the um, Sex Workers Cooperative because they've got ownership. Yep. One of her people uh, has been brutally murdered. Yeah. Um, so we go that way. So at the end of the day, we've got other avenues to go to. And then, so we've gone from, just to re- reiterate, 26th of June, Tuesday, 26th of um, 
uh, of August, sorry, 26th of August, 2003. And then comes uh, a day in January, 2004. So things remain inactive. But in January, 2004, we get a uh, contact from the phone carrier of Kelly's phone. Mm -hmm. They tell us that phone you had a, um, a tag on. Okay, so that's something you'd put in place oh, earlier. Earlier, yeah, very much yeah. so. We haven't got if Kelly's phone. Uh, we put that on, on a holding pattern to say, tag that phone. This yep. is the number. This is the M&I number, et cetera, et cetera, all these other things that they want. And they then know that we need to be notified to reactivate. It, it's, a, it's a hunch. It's, it's, it's a, an avenue we need to cover off on. Uh, and sure enough, all that time later, five months later after the body was located, in January 2004, we get notified that Kelly's phone has been reactivated and we were able to track that phone, her phone, to a male person living in the Melton area. So we do our homework on this particular person and he's nothing untoward. Yeah. And uh, we said, okay, let's. this will be a door knock. We don't have enough for a warrant, even though he's got a phone. Hey, did he get that phone? Did he get it innocently? Do we have enough? We're not going to go in there with the cavalry and do this stuff. So again, no, you, you haven't got enough. You isn't. can't play enough weight on that. Correct. It's a phone that's disappeared. That's yeah, now. That's been right. Reactivated. Could be anywhere. Yeah. It could have been through ten or fifteen hands. And yeah. This guy's ended up with it. Um, if he was an offender, okay, has he uh, waited the time out? Now we reckon he's safe to uh, mm. reactivate it. So it's the make again decision making. Let's uh, knock on the door. Let's go and knock on his door. So Andrew and I go out and knock on his door. Um, interviewed him, and uh, you know we then got to say, well, is he in the suspect category or is he in the witness category? Yeah. By making this a judgment on these people you are in, involved in, and that comes from sheer experience, and uh, we're quite happy with this particular guy, and he's quite apt to us. He says, I got that phone some time ago from a fellow called Novika Jakimov. Yep. So quite open about it. He said, okay, no, that's no where the phone came from. Yeah. Yep. He said I got it off Novika Jakimov. Now, we start then take sending our focus. So we seize the phone off him. So yeah. well, that's, uh, he was able, well, we used to say seize, we asked it for him and we had no power to take it off him. But we yeah. said, look, we'd like to have it because this is what, and he was happy to give it to us. He didn't want to have anything yeah. to do with it. So we, we keep that phone. We put that in through forensically also. We get his uh, fingerprints, his DNA, and to eliminate him yep. uh, as uh, what else we've got on that particular phone. Um, and then we start our investigations looking for this check off Again, the line of inquiry. Um, go to his home address. Never find him at home. Spoke to his family members. We need to speak to him. We don't really declare it. We just say, okay, we need to speak to him about our investigation, et cetera, et cetera. That information gets back to him, wherever yep. he may well be. Um, and then he came in to see us. He made contact with us and came in to see us, so we interviewed him. Now, once we start the interview, again, we're assessing him. Um, I can't recall whether he had priors or not, but um, again, a bit of a, a shonky person. He walks in and uh, he said, oh, well, okay. But you don't want to particularly categorise a particular person. Yeah. Um, we, we'd be dealing with different people and all the suspects we've already had. So he comes in and is quite open about telling us a story. His story was that um, that he and another male were at the casino. This is uh, back five months previous, and they had actually met Kelly because we go through the process of saying this is what it's about. Okay, so he, he acknowledges it. Yeah, he, he, so uh, he accepts that. So yeah. we're making a bit of headway. But they, he says that they, him and his mate met Kelly uh, at the casino and the three of them went back to Jackamoff's house and that was in West Meadows, not far from, I want to say not far, it was certainly in the vicinity of the crime scene where she was found. And his story is we had consensual sex. Okay, she's a sex worker. She's met two people at the casino and gets, well, holds water. It's yeah. not as if she wasn't a sex worker. Um, and that was his story. And then he goes on to say, and I think this is where it comes in where he distances himself. Kelly then left with this other male. Right. He'd tell us who this, he told us who the other male was. So he had a name. Yeah. And then he said, well, she left her phone behind and I just sold it. You know, right. It was okay. an easy, so easy quid to me, mate. Yeah. Well, quite, quite feasible. It's a feasible story. Very much it? so. Yeah. But you, as an investigator, accept all of that. You start, yeah. You're taking in. You're you're the. Yeah, you're, and you got it, he's, you've locked him into a version. That's of right. Events. That's the beauty yeah. of it. Yeah. And uh, you know sometimes you can either call it negative statements, but there's a commitment in the story some way. Yeah. So there's a happy to talk to us. You could say, mate, I don't need to talk to you. 
you know. But again, it's how you approach them, how you talk to them, mm. and how you get their confidence. It's having that rapport with them. And uh, all I want is someone to tell them, tell me a story. Yeah. You know, this is what it's about. Your name's come up. I've linked you to a, a, a victim's phone that's been brutally murdered. Oh, hang on. No, not me. And away they go, which is fantastic. It's how you then go about it. So he tells us he sold it. Okay. Um, that's a criminal offence in itself. But am I worried about that? No, I'm not. Mm. I'm not going to go down that line. I've got enough bigger things to worry about. I've got that phone. That's the main thing. Now, the other male that he identified, we, we, we got him uh, and interviewed him. And he denied completely Jackamoff's story that ever took place. And at this point of time, we were confident that the offender may have been, we, we're still thinking about our fifth suspect. Yeah. Um, of being out. At that stage, we still got that mind on him saying, you know what, he's looking better than what Jackamoff is at this stage. Um, but still awaiting DNA to come back. So we haven't got the DNA to eliminate him at that point, but we had oh, so Okay, so yeah. the, the suspect n number five was yeah. still very much yeah, in the Yeah, because we're still waiting yeah. on that time yeah. because the, he hadn't been eliminated through that uh, early earlier DNA. So things started moving quickly. So in the meantime, we said, okay, we've got Jackamoff telling us the story. Uh, it's consensual sex, three of them at Jackamoff's house. He, she then leaves with this guy. We've interviewed this other guy. He then says, no, that's, that's all crap. Yeah. That didn't happen. Um, so I don't know what he's talking about. Okay, making Jackamoff a liar, I accept what he tells me. Does that make him a killer? No, it doesn't at that particular yeah. point of time. Have I got enough? No, I haven't. So we then decide, okay, let's go, let's, let's revisit um, Jackamoff's house or that locale. So let's go and do a door knock there. And we start the door knock. Yeah. We go back and do a door knock. And the house is surrounding Jackamoff's house. And like we, a, a, a canvas around a, Jackamoff's absolutely. house. Yeah, yep. absolutely. So at that stage, still not enough for a warrant. We mm -hmm. couldn't say, well, let's go in and search his house. Uh, we didn't know where he was putting his head down. Um, so then we started getting neighbours saying, oh, yeah, look, some months ago, there's always this screaming going on from that house. We heard a ruckus going on. We could narrow it down to a particular time, mm -hmm. which fitted our particular time that uh, Kelly was... may have gone missing. So that little snippets of information from a number of, of, of neighbours gave us enough to be go on that, get an affidavit to do a search warrant. Yeah. So we said, we've got nothing else. We've got Jackamoff's story. We've got his mate's story. Okay, do we believe him? No, we don't believe him. How do we support it? We expand the investigation, do a door knock canvas right yeah. through. That builds it up and says, oh, woman screaming about that time. Fact, okay, let's take out a warrant. Okay, so uh, br breaking it down, you've got, and this is the evidence you're working with, you've got uh, Jackamoo that is saying that he was with Kelly Yep. on the time. With another male. With, yep. with another male. So you've got him, him there. The phone alibi, uh, or uh, the, uh, the person that he uh, said he was with, when you've spoken to him, he said, no, that's, that's bullshit. Yep. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't with him. And then you've got neighbours saying they heard uh, a woman screaming, screaming or a disturbance around, around the same, the same time. time. Correct. Okay, so it's tenuous, but there, there's stuff. Uh, there's enough there it to has to be, uh, be through. curious. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah. So like all the other ones, everything we have to follow through to the nth degree. So we take out a warrant, which was great. At that stage, the house is vacant, and Jack and Moff's whereabouts are unknown because he goes back to ground. Nothing to suggest, unlike the movies, don't leave town without telling me. Well, we've got no power to do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, just, they go Wish about we their, did. <laughs> they go about their lives anyway. So we take out the warrant um, and uh, we go from that, that. So we just don't arrive in there. I get there pre-warned and pre-armed. We, we take out a forensic team on the uh, just to, I suppose, alleviate the time gap, etc. Yeah. So we say, guys... Um, can you come along? We take a crime scene examiner. So, so the warrant, the application would be for any uh, evidence relating to uh, the Kelly, yeah. and uh, that uh, might provide and uh, looking for DNA, hair yeah. samples, clothing, yeah, it, it, wide anything, wide thing, anything yeah. involved in an indictable yeah. offence. Yeah, because it's unlike it's same as anything. Even though we've taken out a specific warrant uh, for a specific offence, yeah. if we find uh, firearms or drugs in there, yeah. it doesn't say, oh, hang on, we've only got a warrant. We yeah, can we seize all that. Seize you know, people yeah. may not be aware of that to say, yeah. well, no, you've, you've got a firearms warrant. You can't take these drugs. Yeah. Well, you can. You can. And yeah. all this stuff. So that's where people will be very mindful of. So we take out a forensic team with us, and uh, it was like Aladdin's cave. And that's where, you know, I looked at uh, Andrew and he looked at me when we go in there. We went there um, specifically uh, at night time. Yeah. 
and I say at night time because we there's a process we use, as you well know, with luminol. Yep, and you um, need it dark. And we need it dark, and that reacts with uh, blood and, and similar other items. So we, we go into this particular house. It's vacant, which made things a lot easier for us. We then see and uh, that the, there was plaster repairs on the walls. Luminol was like an iridescent light show because it just lights it all up. You can wash as much blood as you like, yep. but it just reacts with it. And the whole hallway... You could sit there and just like the iridescent lights on the walls and ceilings, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, even the 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 luminol found bloodied footprints, biological matter, m material throughout the hallway where the damage was done, um, and the main luminol was uh, reacting. And that would have, would have got you very interested. Oh, very much so. But and bloodied handprints on a wall, so it's yeah. just like a horror movie. Yeah. Um, and you go in there. Does that mean that's Kelly's at that stage? I don't know. Mm. We've got to start getting that evidence to be able to link it and go from that particular way. So as it had been washed, as the blood of blood wasn't visible as blood, you yep. can't see it, yeah. but it will react to it. Um, it had been washed. We were unable to say that it was actually Kelly's blood. And the, the, the luminol gives you an indication that there might be That's blood right. There. It's only an indicator. Yeah. But we were able to identify DNA. Okay. It might be it might sound a bit silly to say we can't say it's blood, blood. but because of the the residual matter that was left yeah. there, and the uh, we may have washed it with um, with White King or something or other, it doesn't matter. It so it, it, it looked like an effort had been made to very much so tidy it up. Yeah. So it up. consciousness of guilt, but is it another well, again, another victim? Yeah. Is it someone else? But we and again, uh, we were able to say it was Kelly's DNA. This is weeks down the track, of yeah. course because it just doesn't happen overnight. Okay, so you got Kelly's DNA. Yeah, so once we, had, yeah, once we identify Kelly's DNA, uh, we start uh, getting the uh, troops together and saying, okay, we don't know where Jackamoff is, we yep. don't know where he's living, what's the best way to do that? So we then, again, something new, we bring the media back into it, yep. that we're looking, uh, do a media release looking for Jackamoff. And uh, in doing that, we're able to open the whole scope to nationally of looking for it, and sure enough, <coughs> as a result, we get a call made, a confidential call comes in, that uh, Jack Amoff, from an associate, is working at a uh, pizza shop at Lawn, which is a bayside suburb yep. uh, here in Melbourne. So we uh, go down to the uh, pizza shop. Now, this is on uh, Tuesday the 10th of February, 2004. So we've gone from um, the, uh, when did we uh, get the uh, phone reactivation? That was uh, January, January 2004. Yeah. Now we're into February 24, just a, very, a month later. Yeah. It's just where all the time it takes. So we go down the lawn, we identify uh, where he is working out of his pizza shop, and then he's actually living in, in his motor car right. in the lawn. He's working at his pizza shop under an assumed name, but we're able to link it up. So because we're lo we believe we're looking pretty good, given the fact that we've matched up DNA, the DNA's in his house, there's our direct link to the deceased. Yep. So this guy is well above our other five suspects. So we're looking really and good. And the, the alibi evidence didn't check out? Or, or Ex the, exactly. The, she left with Yeah, exactly. Yep. And that was all knocked out by the other people. Now, doing a search, we had uh, paperwork from a stolen passport. Uh, and also in his car, we were able to find a receipt for a storage locker in Ballarat. It might be an innocuous. You might say, well, okay, it's a storage locker. Yeah. So, so what, what weight do you put on it? But you look at everything minutely. We bring him into the office um, and uh, he made a no comment interview. And not until such time. And so we got to a stage to say, you know what? No comment interview. However, as we both know about criticism down the track, fairness and frankness to the mm -hmm. accused, we had to then put to him the fact that we found DNA material from Kelly in your house. Yep. And that was a prompt. Now, it's not a situation where we can hold that back and say, we're not going to tell anyone about it. We'll charge him and take him to court. Mm. We'd be severely criticised yeah, by the court. Because he might have an explanation what Correct. the DNA so was doing. So fairness and frankness, yeah. he's got to be given that. But that was the tilt that he then said, okay, he made, uh, he started making missions. So we was put to him about the sample. He maintained his earlier story of meeting Kelly at the casino. Um, and that's where it sort of stayed, basically, and uh, said nothing more. So based on that, we were confident enough, yep. having that direct link to say, you know what, I'd be confident enough, A, to arrest him, B, that I've got, I could prove it beyond reasonable grounds to a jury, and I said, okay, we make the decision, let's charge him on that. 
Then we take another step further. We said, okay, let's take out a search warrant on this storage locker because yeah. I don't know what we're going to find in there. We might find Kelly's clothes. They're still outstanding. Yeah. So we take out a search warrant on this uh, search on this locker at um, uh, Ballarat. It's all full of furniture that he's taken, obviously, from his West Meadows home while he's living in his car. And again, we, we take a forensic team with us, and on the one of the feet of his couch, we find blood droplets. Who's those blood droplets? Kelly Hodge. Beautiful. So we're able to match that up. So again, another nail in the coffin, yeah. which strengthens my case, which makes me feel a lot more, a lot better in saying, well, clearly we've, we've got that. Whilst they might argue the, um, the accuracy of DNA yeah. at a trial, here we now got direct blood, blood on a couch, on, on, a, on, the, on a receipt that's linked back to Jack Moffat's that's found in his car. There's your direct link. No and one else. It, it, it definitely uh, adds weight to the uh, case. You got yeah, very much him. so. But uh, it's also a reflection of you know, those, those attention to details, the little things like the receipt, following Correct. up, stuff like Correct. that. Because that could be so easily, someone yeah. could be going through it, oh, this is nothing. nothing. That's right. Yeah. Oh, and that's where it's always good to look through uh, people's homes and where they were living. Yeah. So... Um, Later on, uh, Jack Moff did make admissions. In, in what context was that? So you, you've charged him. Yeah, he's gone on the, on his. Um, yeah, I would imagine remanded in custody. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, um, well, well, he's remanded in custody. I think the admissions came um, at the trial. Okay. Because he pleaded not guilty, and uh, he then uh, when the when the crunch actually came. Um, uh, well, we charged him based on the DNA evidence, and then yeah. we shored that up with the blood off the couch. Um, and then he uh, went to trial, stayed in custody, um, and then he later on made admissions uh, that he had actually taken Kelly back to his uh, West Meadows home, and I believe he picked her up from the Skeeler area. Uh, he, has, he then admitted to us that he assaulted her with a spirit level, umbrella, and a vase, pushing her head into the plaster walls, and this, he told us, lasted for about an hour. And the way he described his attack upon Kelly matched the injuries that we'd seen at the post-mortem. Okay. Who else would have known that? Yeah. Nobody. It's got to, and that shears it up again in the mind of the jury. Yeah. So this is the story he was giving at the trial. Um, and we could also show in our investigation, because we've charged someone, the investigation doesn't stop. Mm. We can look at his background. And we were able to show that at the time of the murder that he was a bricklayer and he was working in a, on a job at a place called Beveridge. And to get to Beveridge, you have to drive past the crime scene. Oh, so familiar with the area. Exactly. Yep. Another nail in the coffin. There's another link to say you knew the area, you lived, work in this location, you drove at that location. And as I said, he pleaded not guilty, but in the sworn evidence, he gave that, that admission um, but he claims self-defence. You know, yeah. Weirdly enough, yeah. given the significant injuries, he yeah. claims self-defence, saying that Kelly had attacked him. Mm. And clearly the jury didn't buy it. Yeah. And they said, mate, you're full of it. Um, they looked at the significance of the injuries and said, mate, this is a guy who's gone berserk on a petite young 20-year-old yeah. well, girl. Where, where's self-defence exactly. coming to it? Um, and, you know, this is where you think about time getting away from you. He was sentenced to 19 years imprisonment. So he gave that story. He might say, OK, I'm entitled to defend myself. This is how I assaulted her. Mm. But it was in self-defence. Yeah. That's the story we want to come up with. They didn't buy it. Sentenced to 19 years imprisonment. Uh, and as far as I know, he was paroled in 2017. So he's back out in the community. Well, 19 years he served it. And uh, he's uh, served his, um, his uh, debt to society and but it never brings uh, her back. But a bit of a postscript in relation... Just, just, uh, yep. how, how, how did you feel, mate? You're, you've had a lot of experience in homicides and you've, you've had the success, the results, and mm. there, there's a certain you know, elation you get when you finally got enough to charge someone. And yep. then, as you identified earlier on, the hard work quite often begins getting through the trial and then you've uh, got the trial. Um, you're the person that you've paid homage to, uh, Andrew Fitzpatrick. Cal Kilpatrick. Uh, Kilpatrick. Yep. Um, how did he feel? Oh, very much so. But that then drives him, not that he needed much drive, and yeah. all of us really, of being tenacious, a tenacious investigator. And, uh, you know, that showed as an example to other detectives yeah. in the office that you don't give up. Um, you, you keep on going 
and the tenacity, that's what it's all about. And to get a result after five or six months, people say, you know, well, it's all too hard. She could have met anybody. And, and, and because she was a sex worker, the sad, sad but truth is there's not a lot of push. No. The, the, it's not the, the, the public, the, the, yeah. the organisation. It, yeah. And it wasn't a public uh, a thing, a public outcry to yeah. say, you know, one like Jill Maher, for example. Yeah. With Bailey. Uh, it, you know, but the thing is, we're the, uh, you've said, and I've heard you say yeah. it, and, uh, and we've all been it. We're the voice for them. Yeah. You know, there's no one else apart from the family, but they haven't got the, the voice that we have publicly. Mm. Uh, and we are looking for that. And, and people may have forgotten about it all these months later and said, oh, that's right. I, I wonder what happened to that job. Well, we can tell you that we got a result and this yeah. guy was sentenced and this guy is off the streets um, and, and sentenced quite considerably years to uh, not hurt anybody and, else. And they exactly, not hurt anyone else. Like This is the, the importance of, of homicide that uh, they need to uh, push. And it's quite often just the tenacity of one or two people on the strike force. Exactly, that, and that's uh, all it means. Across the line. And, and realistically, and then... As as you and I both know, we don't look for um, pats on the back. We just that's the job we do. That's the job. We love the job yeah. in relation to getting results and the thrust and parry of dealing with barristers and the court system, the legal system, the justice system, playing by the rules. The crooks don't this and that, and dealing with families. Uh, and as we go, and and often, you know, we become supporters. Uh, let's not lose sight of the fact because we charge offenders. We just don't write off the offenders' families. We support them too. Exactly. There's a uh, there's so many people who are impacted. Off exactly. The exactly. And then we don't know the impact we have. And because we dealt with so closely with the uh, sex workers uh, cooperative in St Kilda, who are a bit of a our own little mini police force in themselves yeah. with their own intelligence, that they sent us a thank you card, a big thank you card signed by all the sex workers, thanking yeah. us for caring. And is, isn't that oh. like is some, something like that? That means so much. That, oh. uh, little things like that give you the strength to go hard. Exactly. And you say, you know job. what, we are appreciated yeah. because often police don't get the recognition that they deserve. Sure, there's uh, police out there that, that, that don't do what they should be getting paid to do and uh, they don't go to the nth degree and don't have the empathy. Yeah. It's just a job. But it's, uh, it's dealing, you know, the relationships you build, as we both have, with, with families... We've had dinners at family homes. Yeah. We've had drinks with them. When we have acquittals at trials, you know, we're dejected, the family's dejected, and they say, come on, Charlie, let's go and have a few beers. Yeah. They take us out and support because they know that we have done 110%. That's the relationships you build that last for years. Yeah. And here we have a, 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 a sex workers cooperative just thanking us for caring because yeah. no one else did. Yeah. And I think it's, yeah. It's what you need to do. If you're going to call yourself a homicide detective, you've got to put that uh, that type of effort in. But I've, uh, like sitting here, you've just take, taken me back. I mm. don't know if I'm tired <laughs> or want to, yeah. But that's the nature of homicide. And it, it just reminded me of how many different things, how many moving parts there are in a homicide investigation. You get the highs and the lows. And, yeah, I, I think people listening to this have been very fortunate. Have someone with Charlie's experience just breaking down the day-to-day way investigations are uh, cracked and, and homicides are uh, solved. Do you miss it, Charlie? Very much so. That's what you miss is, yeah. is the um, is the chase. You know, you start with nothing apart from a, a deceased person at a, at a scene and to build up, as we've just outlined in this particular yeah. case, to build up and the false leads, it, you don't get dejected, you move on while you're balancing other work and then you know what? The, the things you really look for is, is going back, whilst it's, it's difficult, as you've touched upon, going to a, a family of a deceased person and saying, I'm sorry to tell you about, we've found a person that we believe is your daughter, is et cetera, et cetera, is, is then the crescendo coming back and knocking on their door and saying, we have just arrested somebody for yeah. your daughter's murder. Uh, and then there's, there's a, a sigh of relief in that regard, mm-hmm. never brings their daughter, loved one back, but at least someone's been held to account based upon what we have done. It, it helps. It doesn't give them closure, but it certainly uh, certainly helps. So, Very much. Um, well, I yeah, thank you for your services and thanks for being the, the true homicide detective. And I, I I mean that when I say it, and you know know what I'm I'm saying. Yeah, likewise that, so. to you too, Gary. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Thanks, Charles. Thank you, mate. Bye. Cheers.